Friends, we are here to worship Almighty God today. This worship is for the people of Clarely Park Presbyterian Church and all others who join us by means of uh, the internet. We're glad that you're here, that we can worship God together. My name is Kevin Livingston, and I'm the pastor of Clarely Park Presbyterian Church. Let's hear these words of scripture as the Lord calls us to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's worship our God together. lift up our prayers of praise and adoration to Almighty God. O oh God, you are infinite, eternal and unchangeable, glorious in holiness, full of love and mercy, abundant in your grace and your truth. Everywhere, O oh God, your works praise you and your glory is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, we pray that today as we sing your praise, as we gather virtually together, that you would make us mindful, Lord, that we are coming into the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. All glory and all praise and all honor be to you, blessed and holy Trinity, one God forever and ever. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. All too often we have turned from our neighbors and refused to hear the burdens of others ignoring the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness that we might choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Brothers and sisters, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives all our sins strengthen us in all goodness 
and by the power of God's Spirit, keep us in eternal life. If you're worshiping with someone now, would you extend the peace of Christ to them with a word or an embrace? The peace of Christ be with you today. Hello, church family. Our reading today is from Luke 10, 25 to 37, the story of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side too. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
The sermon is entitled, Showing Mercy. You can tell a lot about a person by the way they treat those who can do nothing for them. Watch the way people respond to the checkout lady at the grocery store or the person standing next to them in line to catch the bus or the subway. The way we act toward other people around us is a reflection of the kind of character we have. And whether or not we keep our promises or meet our deadlines or honor our commitments or show grace to others when we're under pressure reveals a lot about the kind of character that we have. D.L. Moody once said that character is who you are in the dark when nobody else is looking. In other words, character is what we are in the secret chambers of our hearts. It's about the basic shape of our inner motives and attitudes and values that then spring forth publicly in the decisions we make, the actions we take, and the kind of lives that we live. And I think that most people would agree, whether you're a committed Christian or not, that developing character is one of the basic tasks in life that we better not neglect if we want to become the kind of persons that we know we ought to be. And what I've been suggesting over these last several weeks in our worship together at Clarely Park is that the Bible gives us a roadmap, a, a pathway to developing our character. It's found in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes or the blessings that, that were spoken by Jesus at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. In these Beatitudes, we're given a picture of the kind of character that God wants to build into every human life, including yours and mine. The Beatitudes are eight qualities or, or character traits that God values in the lives of his creatures. They call us to be meek and merciful, to be poor in spirit and pure in heart, uh, mourning and hungry, peacemakers and persecuted. And taken together, they form a picture that describes what Jesus is looking for in all those who would follow him. They show us the balanced, diverse character of Christian people. Taken together, they describe the kind of character that, that Jesus himself had, and they provide us with a blueprint for what every follower of Jesus ought to be like. And I believe that as we consider these qualities and integrate them into our lives, we'll receive the blessings that Jesus promised. Well, looking back, we can see that the first four Beatitudes that we've been looking at reveal a logical spiritual progression. To begin with, Jesus says we are to be poor in spirit, acknowledging our complete, utter spiritual bankruptcy before God. We're standing in need. Next, we are to mourn over the cause of that condition, which is our sin, when we close our hearts to God and disobey God's law and our relationship with God and with other people gets confused. Third, we are to be meek, to be humble and gentle towards other people, allowing our own spiritual poverty to shape the way we act towards God and towards other people. And fourth, we are, to be, we are to hunger and to thirst for righteousness, to desire more than anything else to be the kind of good and faithful persons God created us to be. Because what's the good of admitting the truth about ourselves to God and to others if we simply leave it there but don't do anything about it? We are to hunger and to thirst to become the kind of men and women God wants us to be. 
and the kind of persons that deep down inside we know we ought to be. But now, friends, as we move to the next four Beatitudes, the next four blessings Jesus speaks, we're going to turn from our posture towards God, being poor in spirit, mourning over our sin, meek and humble, thirsty and hungry for God's goodness. We're going to turn from that toward the kind of character Jesus calls us to have toward other people toward our fellow human beings. And today, we begin with mercy. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. First of all, a definition of mercy. How would you define it, giving a dictionary definition? Well, the di one dictionary I consulted defines mercy as this. It says, refraining from harming or punishing persons who are in one's power and who deserve punishment. That's a little negative, but that's a good place to start. And that's somewhat similar to what the Apostle Paul says in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. The Apostle Paul writes, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, friends, the reason we're called to be merciful is that God himself is merciful towards us. Jesus, our Lord, is merciful towards us. And those of us who want to follow Jesus must walk in the footsteps of the Master by being merciful in the way we treat other people, too. The historian Rodney Stark argues that Christianity's revolutionary emphasis on mercy was one huge factor that helped capture the attention of the ancient world. In his book, The Triumph of Christianity, Stark writes, in the midst of the squalor, misery, illness, and anonymity of ancient cities, Christianity provided an island of mercy and security. It all started with Jesus. By contrast, Stark writes, in the pagan world, and especially among the philosophers, mercy was regarded as a character defect and pity as a pathological emotion because mercy involved providing unearned help or relief it's contrary to justice. And quoting one of the philosophers, Stark cites, humans must learn to curb the impulse to show mercy. The cry of the undeserving for mercy must go unanswered. Showing mercy was a defect of character, unworthy of the wise, and excusable only in those who have not yet grown up. Wow! That's the way the ancient world thought. And into that world of unmercy, Jesus and the gospel and the early church began as a people of mercy toward one another. Jesus came and turned the tables upside down. He taught that the true God was a God of mercy and benevolence and grace. Jesus embodied that mercy and grace in his own life in his ministry of healing and caring and teaching and sharing. And now we are called and empowered to live with mercy toward other people the way God has towards us. In the Bible, mercy is, can be defined as compassion for people in need. Now Jesus, in his beatitude, doesn't tell us the, the type of person that we're called to be merciful to. He doesn't give any indication 
who the recipients of this mercy are to be. Was Jesus primarily thinking of those overcome by some disaster? Like the traveler on the road from Jericho to from Jerusalem to Jericho, who was ambushed and assaulted on the road by robbers, upon whom the good Samaritan had mercy? That was the text that Denise read for us a few minutes ago. Or was he thinking primarily of, of hungry people or sick people or, or outcast and homeless people whom our Lord noticed and so often came alongside of to help? Or perhaps was Jesus thinking of, of people who'd been wronged, people who'd been hurt by others? But his challenging message was that even though justice cried out for their punishment, Mercy trumps that verdict with a call to forgive the offender. Well, friends, the New Testament seems clear. God's mercy extends to all those people. And so we, as followers of Jesus, are called to show mercy to others as well. The longer I live, I'm increasingly aware of my own personal need for God's mercy in my life. And that leads me to want to show mercy to others. Because I've been shown mercy, I should be willing to show it, to, to, to give it, to embody it toward those around me. Mercy is more than just tolerating people we don't like or someone who's hurt us. Mercy means that we get inside the other person's skin so we can begin to see life through their eyes, to walk a mile in their moccasins, as the old saying goes, to feel pain as they felt it, thus becoming a catalyst for their healing. Mercy doesn't mean that we condone bad behavior in other people, but it does mean that we refuse to view these other people as our enemies. It means we, we resist punishing or judging those whose behavior offends us. It means we resist taking judgment into our own hands against those who've hurt us or who've rejected us or who slander or make fun of our deepest convictions. Hey, I read something fascinating this week. Up to a third of people in North America say that they lie awake at least a few nights a week. How about you? Do you sometimes lie awake at night? Um, you can try meditation or, or medication, as the psychologists and counselors will advise. But according to a study published in the Journal of Psychology and Health, there's another practice you can consider the practice of forgiveness, of showing mercy. Researchers ask 1,423 adults to rate themselves on how likely they, are, they were to forgive themselves for the things they did wrong and to forgive other people for hurting them. And they also ask questions about how they'd slept over the last 30 days. You know what the researchers found? The results suggest that people who were more forgiving were more likely to sleep better and for longer, and in turn have better physical health. Forgiveness, the, re the researchers concluded, may help people leave the day's regrets and offenses in the past and it promotes sound sleep. Otherwise, as many troubled sleepers have experienced, we might have too much on our minds to get any rest. The researchers explain that, that people who don't forgive tend to linger on their unpleasant thoughts and feelings, anger, blame, regret. They keep turning those bad experiences over and over again in their minds, repetitive thoughts about distress. And that resentment and that bitterness 
can detract from a person's sleep quality and well-being, the study suggests. That was from an article in the Washington Post. In other words, showing mercy is a healthy habit for us to develop. And I think that's true not just for as individuals, but how I wish we would learn to do that more and more as a culture in our polarized, fragmented, argumentative, clashing culture. It's a polarized and a stressful time. I don't need to tell you that. Every time you turn on the news, you see it. In our culture today and around the world, it feels like mistrust and partisanship and violence are growing. Just look at what's happening south of the border right now as they approach their, their main election. There are ever widening gaps of understanding one another and the polarizations and the conflicts that people are feeling towards one another are growing. But friends, mercy, mercy is that divine gift Jesus gives that helps us separate the value of who persons are from their behaviors and their attitudes. It helps us not just see them as, as opponents or as, or as enemies with defective political or moral or social viewpoints, but to embrace them as persons made in the image of God who matter to God. Now again, let me say, mercy doesn't mean that we abandon our convictions about what's right and wrong. Jesus in the Gospels makes it very clear that certain ways of living and behaving are no longer an option for those who would follow him. But mercy does mean that we monitor and control how we communicate our convictions so that we don't do anything to destroy the relationships that we have with people we may disagree with. Mercy, in fact, leads us to pray for people that we believe need to change instead of merely judging and confronting and pressuring them to become the kind of people we think they ought to be. And friends, this leads us to another truth about mercy that Jesus teaches us. Jesus relates giving mercy to receiving mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The most incredible thing about our relationship with God is that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. He died for us, not after we shaped up and got righteous, but he died for us while we were still sinners, undeserving of his mercy. And because God has shown incredible mercy toward us, it's clear that as followers of Jesus, we're to be merciful towards others. Jesus once told a story about a man who owed a certain king an astronomical amount of money. It was a debt that would have been impossible for him to pay back, even in a whole lifetime. But rather than throw the man in jail, the king, in mercy, forgave the man all his debt. Out of sheer kindness, that massive bill was wiped clean. But as soon as that man, that same man, went out of the king's presence and went out into the street, rejoicing at the debt that he had been forgiven of, of he ran into another fellow, a fellow who was his debtor. And this other fellow owed the man a tiny amount, $20. But this time, rather than extending the same mercy that had been given to him when he couldn't pay, when that other gentleman said, I can't pay, can you wait? Let me make it up to you, let me try. That man refused to grant mercy and he threw the debtor into prison. Well, news got back to the king. 
And when the king heard about this man's lack of mercy, he became angry and threw that man into prison. Well, Jesus tells this parable in one of the Gospels, I think, to show us how God feels when once we have received his mercy, then we hesitate to give mercy and show it to our neighbor. Friends, if we are unloving, if we are unforgiving, if we are unmerciful with the failures and sins of other people, it probably means that we have never stood before Jesus helpless, exposed, and needing his mercy ourselves. We've never realized how much we need God's mercy, and so we aren't merciful towards others who need ours. As the book of Titus puts it in the New Testament, God saved us not because of righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. The Apostle Paul speaks in Colossians about Jesus taking our sins and, and nailing them to his cross. He's referring to a custom in the ancient days to create a list of charges for any person who was accused of a crime. But when a nail was driven through a charge list, it was proof that the charges had been paid for, they'd been canceled, they'd been forgiven. And when Jesus was nailed to the cross, all the charges against us were paid and nailed to his cross. So if Jesus paid for all sins on the cross, why do we still seek to make some people pay for what we consider to be their sins? Because Jesus has already paid it all. Mercy, rooted in Christ's sacrifice on the cross, can break the cycle of judgment and retaliation and intolerance and hatred that's so prevalent in our world today. And another thing, mercy rooted in Christ's sacrifice on the cross can move us out of our complacency to show God's love, to show God's love even to those who can never repay us. I read an amazing story this week that embodies that kind of love. It's in Portland Magazine, a priest at a Roman Catholic church in Portland, Oregon, not far from my home, told a story about a street person named Big Ben who came daily to the church. Listen to what the priest said. One Christmas Eve, we decided to have a special cafe evening to minister to the homeless. An unusually large number of people came. At 9 p.m., we were down to the very last pot of soup, though the hungry line still wove around the block. By 9.30, we were down to the very last bowl, and there was Big Ben, face a light with his toothless grin. We filled up Big Ben's bowl to the brim, much to his delight, and that was the last of the last of the soup. As Ben made his way to the table in the corner, a tiny teenage boy whom none of us had ever seen before appeared. He looked like he'd slept in the mud. He was shivering from lack of a coat, and his left eye sported a nasty bruise. Seeing that the last of the soup had already been served, his eyes grew large, and it seemed like he was about to burst out in tears. But he didn't. God knows how long he'd waited in line, only to find no soup. Some of us were reaching for our wallets, when Big Ben appeared with his hot steaming bowl of soup and he handed it to the boy. He then put his hand on the boy's cheek and caressed it like a father would caress his sons. 
and then he mussed the boy's hair and giggled and wandered off into the night. The priest concludes, it was a tender moment that stood in contrast to the steel, concrete, and cold that too often embrace those without a hearth and home. It was a moment that knitted us all together a little more tightly and made me proud of my species. And it made me see, maybe for the first time, why God wanted to become human in Jesus Christ after all. Friends, may God help us more and more to become mercy people, giving mercy and extending compassion, loving without expecting anything in return, because that's the way our Lord is with us. That's what I want for Claire Lee Park Presbyterian Church, to be a people and a place where all people are welcome, regardless of their condition, or their problems, or their background. Because acts of mercy open the door for people to meet Jesus, who otherwise might have the door shut in their face. Dear friends, merciful people realize that God gives more grace than most of us can ever imagine. If God allows us, with all of our sins and failures and unworthiness, to call him Father, shouldn't we give that same mercy to others? As Max Lucado has written, one thing's for sure, when we get to heaven, we'll be surprised at some of the folks we see. And some of them will be surprised when they see us. When we become merciful, we begin to see persons with the same perspective with which we see ourselves, forgiven sinners, imperfect, but loved by God. We begin to identify with that tax collector who said, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So as I close, let me ask us all a question. Just how merciful are we? Who in your world this week needs a gift of mercy from you? Who in your world needs your forgiveness, your patience, your compassion, your understanding? Let's pray this week that the Holy Spirit will provide all of us with the capacity to give those persons God puts in our way the mercy that we have received from Jesus. And pray that God will do the changing of that person and we will do the loving. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on all of us and grant us the grace to show your mercy and share your forgiving, extravagant love with everyone we meet and interact, this, interact with this week. For the glory and honor of your name, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. It's always good to give thanks to the Lord. Let's join now in uh, celebrating the presence of God and all of God's good gifts to us by listening to this song by Don Moen and his worship team, a lovely song called Thank You, Lord. And you can join in. It's easy to learn.
come before you today There's just one thing that I want to say Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord For all you've given to me Blessings that I cannot see. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm.
what a wonderful song. It arises out of our hearts to say thank you to God for all his goodness and all his love poured out on our lives. We also want to take time to lift up our hearts to the Lord and intercede for the needs of the world. And today we're going to be focusing on the way that Presbyterian sharing uh, uh, contributes to Christ's mission around the world. Through our gifts and donations, we are supporting missionaries and the church across Canada and all of the different ministries that are represented in the Presbyterian Church in Canada. So here's a short video that explains Presbyterian sharing, and after that, we will pray to the Lord. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. When God's people work together, small actions have the potential to grow into something bigger than we can imagine. We are the Presbyterian Church in Canada. We worship in over 800 communities and partner in ministry in over 31 countries, sharing God's love across Canada and throughout the world. Presbyterians Sharing funds the overall mission and ministry we do together. Presbyterian World Service and Development is our international development and relief agency. Together, we live out the gospel message in word and action. Empowered by the Spirit, we revitalize churches and support innovative worship. We empower young people to grow in their faith and prepare leaders to serve the church. We help congregations sponsor refugees and care for displaced people around the world. We provide relief in emergencies and promote access to food, education, and health care for all. We care for God's creation and advocate for human rights. We walk with indigenous peoples on a journey of healing and reconciliation. We work with international partners in leadership development, Christian education, and evangelism. The ministry of Christ through the Presbyterian Church in Canada is alive and growing. We are called to love and serve one another. Together, we are making a difference. Together, we are the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Let's lift up our prayers to the Lord. Oh God, this is a difficult time for many of us, a difficult year that's marked by disappointment and loneliness and fear. We long for things to go back to normal, or at least to know how long this pandemic will last. But you ask us to be patient and to hold on and to cling to you. We remember, O oh God, that we're not alone in our struggle. We remember that we belong to a congregation of your people and to people around the world that, that love Jesus and are called to serve him. Indeed, O oh God, we do all these things together, and we share the struggle of the whole world in these days, and we remember that many others are suffering so much more than we are. We pray for people who are homeless, for refugees, and for those who are struggling to meet their basic needs and care for their families. We pray for people whose homes are not safe to shelter, either because they are too poorly equipped or because of domestic abuse or violence. We pray, Lord, for indigenous peoples and others whose circumstances have made this pandemic especially difficult. We pray for people, including members of our own congregation and long-term care facilities, who are so isolated and at greater risk of illness. We pray, Lord, for those among us and beyond our community who have lost income, whose businesses are struggling, whose meager savings are in jeopardy. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and for the loved ones of those who have tragically died. Give us faith, O God, not only to endure through difficult times, but to respond to your call to work in your vineyard even now, 
sharing from our resources of time and talents and treasure as we participate in Christ's mission in the world. May your Holy Spirit give us everything we need so that together we can be people of love and care and generosity and hospitality for those who so desperately need to experience your presence and catch a glimpse of your hope in their lives. We pray for the Presbyterian Church in Canada, for each congregation, ministry, and mission. Give each one, Lord, a sense of purpose and bless them with creativity and love and all the resources they need to reach out in Jesus' name. Bless us together as a denomination and make us one in faith and hope and love. Teach us to respect our differences and to pray for one another as siblings in Christ. Bind us together in our shared faith and grow our friendship and unity with one another and with other Christian congregations and churches too. We pray, Lord, today especially for the mission and ministries that we do, we do together through Presbyterian sharing. We pray for regional and national staff, for committees and volunteers who work carefully to support congregations in these difficult days. Give them wisdom and energy to do the work that's set before them. We pray for our international mission staff and partners around the world who are sharing the good news of your kingdom of love and justice. We remember, Lord, the indigenous ministries of our church across Canada and pray for their leaders and members, especially in light of the severe impact of the pandemic on so many communities. We pray that the healing and reconciliation work of our church will help build good relationships between indigenous peoples in Canada and the rest of us. Bless those who are speaking out for the voiceless seeking justice. We pray for wisdom in their words and that their messages will be heard with open ears. We pray for students and faculty and staff in our theological colleges, Knox College, Presbyterian College, Montreal, and Vancouver School of Theology. And yes, Lord, for Tyndale Seminary, where I teach as well. We pray that you will work through the colleges and seminaries and teachers to equip your church in an ever-changing world. Gracious God, pour out your blessing on Clarely Park Presbyterian Church, that we may be encouraged and equipped to be the church today and in the, and in the days ahead. Give us faith to embody the loving presence of Jesus in our families and our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, and everywhere that your children are suffering or in need. We pray and trust that God loves us in faith that the Spirit hears us and knows our needs and in hope of the coming kingdom that our Lord Jesus promised. And hear us now, Lord, as we together pray the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, now go from this worship service in God's peace, ready to show God's mercy and love to all those you encounter. And receive now the blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and on all that you love this day and forevermore.
Amen.